Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. In this lecture we will begin making our way down the long and windy road towards reactor kinetics. Now this course doesn't really pull any punches when it comes to diving into the material. Unfortunately we must dive into some serious mathematical concepts before we can even begin discussing kinetics. So please be patient for the first couple of lectures in this course. Things will get better, or if you're a math geek like me, then go ahead and enjoy the ride. We will start our journey into this strange world of reactor kinetics by discussing operator notation and then by discussing the adjoint flux. Long story short, operator notation makes our mathematical endeavors much more convenient and, as you'll see later, through the power of adjoints we'll be able to more accurately model reactor kinetics parameters and reactor behavior. Operator notation provides a way to conveniently and quickly summarize complicated functions integrals, and other mathematical trickery with just one single letter. Here, for example, we have the operator notation version for the Boltzmann transport equation. This equation would normally take up one or two full lines, but thanks to the magic of operators, it only takes up this small space. You'll see exactly how useful this is later when we derive the first order perturbation equation. Now, before we actually discuss the operators in this Boltzmann transport equation, First we should talk about some properties for linear operators, which the Boltzmann transport equation operator is one of. Other linear operators include derivatives, integrals, and Laplace transforms, which you'll see more of later. First, linear operators follow the associative property, which means that when the operator m acts on phi1 plus some phi2, it is equivalent to m operating on phi1 plus m operating on phi2. Likewise, if there is some change or some delta in m, then the result of this combined m operating on phi is equivalent to m operating on phi plus delta m operating on phi. Another property is that when an operator sees a function that has been multiplied by a constant, the result of this operation is equivalent to moving the constant outside of the expression. Here the constant is the c0. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, Linear operators do not follow the commutative property, which means that they do not behave like multiplication. An operator is like some sort of black box. It takes the function phi and does some mysterious things to it. We do not necessarily get the same result when the opposite happens, the backwards process happens, and phi operates on m. These properties, while somewhat unfamiliar or perhaps even confusing, will be very important later. Now let's dive into the Boltzmann transport equations. The first of the operators in the Boltzmann transport equation is the neutron loss operator, M, which represents the neutron leakage, scattering source, and total collisional terms in the Boltzmann transport equations, as defined here. It may be a little confusing, but this expression I'm showing here is M operating on phi. Now if we were trying to just look at m by itself and take the flux out of these equations, then the m neutron loss operator would simply be omega dot the gradient of something minus the integrals over the solid angle and energy prime functions of the double differential scattering cross-section times something, and then sigma t times something. When we have m operate on phi, it inserts phi into the place of all these somethings in these equations. The fission operator F is reflected in the fission source term, which is chi divided by 4 pi times the integrals over solid angle and energy, both prime, of nu sigma F times the neutron flux. This all assumes that there is no independent neutron source in the system, which will pretty much entirely be true throughout this course. As with the M operator, the fission operator by itself can be obtained just by leaving a blank spot where the neutron flux is right here. The last term in the Boltzmann transport equation is this lowercase lambda, which is simply equal to 1 over the eigenvalue for our system. Now through the power of this operator notation, the Boltzmann transport equation can be written more easily and much more conveniently as m phi equals lambda f phi, or alternatively, m minus lambda f operating on phi is equal to zero. 
Now let's dive into the adjoint flux and the adjoint Boltzmann transport equation. The adjoint is often a difficult concept to understand for most people, and it's really something that we don't discuss at all in undergraduate nuclear engineering curriculum. But it's actually one of my favorite mathematical concepts in all of nuclear engineering. We care about the adjoint because, and as we'll see soon, it is used to more accurately calculate kinetics parameters, and it is also a key part of the perturbation equations, which we will discuss soon. The adjoint flux, phi star, which is sometimes known as phi dagger instead of the star, describes how important a neutron is to the fission chain reaction, or in other words, to the eigenvalue of a system. Because of this definition, the adjoint flux is often known as the importance of neutrons. Now there can be adjoints for other kinds of things, for how important a neutron is to a fission rate or a capture rate or a flux in a certain part of the system, but for this course we will limit our adjoint discussion to the eigenvalue adjoints, to phi star. To illustrate what this importance represents, consider for example a neutron that thermalizes and then heads towards plutonium fuel. This neutron is very important because it is very likely to cause fission and thus to contribute to the eigenvalue of the system and continue the chain reaction. In contrast, a neutron that leaks from the system because it hits vacuum boundaries is not important because it is no longer part of the fission chain reaction. Likewise, a neutron that is captured by reactor structure or some non-fizzle isotope or just by a parasitic capture reaction anywhere is also not important. One of the most useful parts of the adjoint flux lies in the property of adjoints, which is when we take the inner product of the adjoint operating on some other operators, we can rearrange the order of these terms. We can switch the inner and the outermost terms in this inner product by taking the adjoint of the M or the F operators that are in the middle of this inner product. Now this is a lot to take in, and I haven't even explained what an inner product is yet. So let's back up and start there. The inner product of some quantity f really just takes the integral of f over all of its dependent variables. Essentially, we take the total sum of our f quantity over the entire system. An example of this is if we might want to find the total number of neutrons integrated over space, energy, and direction in some system. Another example, which we probably saw in our undergraduate courses, was if you want to determine the fission rate in the entire system because you want to normalize the power in that reactor. Essentially, this inner product is the Liam Neeson of mathematical operators. It will find your variables and it will integrate them. So, according to the property of adjoints, if we take the inner product of this quantity, we can switch the order of phi and phi star in these inner products by taking the adjoint of our M or F operators. You'll see why this is important pretty soon, but I guess for a spoiler, this property is required to derive the first order perturbation equation, which you'll do in a couple lectures from now. This first order perturbation equation is important because it predicts how the reactor's power will change in response to some perturbation in the system or some reactivity insertion. So the property of adjoints is really, really important what are these m star and f star terms? And also, how do we even solve for this incredibly useful and somewhat mysterious adjoint flux? Well, we can solve for the adjoint flux by solving the adjoint version of the Boltzmann transport equation. Just like how there is a forward or regular version of the neutron flux and also an adjoint version of the flux, there is an adjoint version of the Boltzmann transport equation that is a reflection of the regular forward version of the Boltzmann transport equations. Now this adjoint Boltzmann transport equation satisfies the same properties as the forward version of the transport equation. So if we actually have these m star and f star and lambda star terms, we can solve for the adjoint flux, just like how we might solve for the forward flux using the regular Boltzmann transport equation. So again, what the heck are lambda star, f star, and m star. Well, we'll actually derive m star and f star in the next lecture, but we'll prep for doing that by looking at a quick example that uses the dreaded matrix math. So 
So for this problem, we'll consider some vector x, a vector y, and some matrix A. Now with the data in these vectors and in this matrix, we would like to develop an expression for A star, which is the adjoint version of A that satisfies the property of adjoints. So we want to be able to take the adjoint of A and switch the order of x and y in this inner product. Now we will demonstrate how to solve for the coefficients in A star for this quick example, and in this next lecture, we'll use the same exact approach to derive m star and f star. So let's start by looking at the inner product of y operating on a operating on x. Matrix math, and function math in general, dictates that we start from the inside and work outwards. So this ax term becomes a11 times x1 plus a21 times x2 on the top, and then we have a12x1 plus a22x2 on the bottom. We multiply this by the y vector, we get x1, y1, a11 plus x2, y1, a21 plus x1, y2, a12 plus x2, y2, a22. And let's see what we get when we take the inner product of x, a star, and y. And remember, in doing this, we want to solve for whatever coefficients in a star will make this inner product equivalent to the result of the inner product for y a x. a star operating on y becomes a star 1 1 y 1 plus a star 2 1 y 2 and then on the bottom we have a star 1 2 y 1 plus a star 2 2 y 2. After we multiply this expression by the x vector we get x 1 y 1 a star 1 1 plus x2 y1 a star 1 2 plus x1 y2 a star 2 1 plus x2 y2 a star 2 2. And this expression again must equal the inner product from before of y a x. Now because x1 x2 y1 and y2 can assume any kind of value whatsoever the only way possible to guarantee that these expressions will be equal all the time is if a star 1 1 is equal to a 1 1, if a star 1 2 is equal to a 2 1, if a star 2 1 is equal to a 1 2, and lastly if a star 2 2 is equal to a 2 2. This means that the a star matrix is equal to a matrix with these values which, if we recall the original values in the A matrix, is actually equal to the transpose of the A matrix. So with this, we have derived a version of the adjoint function that satisfies our property of adjoints for this XY example here. This ends our quick breakneck introduction into adjoint functions and their properties. Next time we will continue our journey into adjoint land by deriving the adjoint transport equation itself.